A reading from the letter of St. Paul to the Romans. Brothers and sisters, through one man sin entered the world, and through sin death. And thus death came to all men, inasmuch as all sinned. If by that one person's transgression the many died, how much more did the grace of God and the gracious gift of the one man, Jesus Christ, overflow for the many? For if by the transgression of the one, death came to reign through that one, how much more will those who receive the abundance of grace and the gift of justification come to reign in life through the one, Jesus Christ? In conclusion, just as through one transgression, condemnation came upon all, so through one righteous act, acquittal and life came to all. For just as through the disobedience of one man, the many were made sinners, so through the obedience of the one, the many will be made righteous. Where sin increased, grace overflowed all the more, so that as sin reigned in death, grace also might reign through justification for eternal life through Jesus Christ, our Lord. The word of the Lord. Thanks. Here I am, Lord. I come to do your will. Sacrifice or oblation you wished not, but ears open to obedience you gave me, burnt offerings or sin offerings you sought not. Then said I, Behold, I come. In the written scroll it is prescribed for me to do your will, O my God, is my delight, and your law is within my heart. I announced your justice in the vast assembly. I did not restrain my lips as you, O Lord, know. May all who seek you exalt and be glad in you. And may those who love your salvation say ever, the Lord be glorified. at all times and pray that you may have the strength to stand before the Son of Man. Dominus Fobiscum. Lexia Sancti Evangelii Secundum Lucam. Jesus said to his disciples, Gird your loins and light your lamps and be like servants who await their master's return from a wedding, ready to open immediately when he comes and knocks. Blessed are those servants whom the master finds vigilant on his arrival. 
Amen, I say to you, he will gird himself, have them recline at table, and proceed to wait on them. And should he come in the second or third watch and find them prepared in this way, blessed are those servants. Verbum Domini. First of all, I want to wish a happy patronal name day to all of our John Pauls out there, including our own Father John Paul and our server, John Paul Garcia, here today who are blessed with that name of this remarkable man, one of the most remarkable men in all of history, Pope St. John Paul II, whose feast we celebrate today. And what was it that made him so remarkable? Well, he himself told us at the inauguration of his pontificate, open wide the doors to Christ. Open wide the doors to Christ. And his very first encyclical was on Christ, the Redeemer of Man. And here's the very first sentence of that first of his encyclicals. The Redeemer of Man, Jesus Christ, is the center of the universe and of history. That's what made him remarkable. That's what makes us remarkable. That's what gives us divine life. Jesus, open wide the doors for Christ. He would want me to repeat this morning to this worldwide audience that we're privileged to address. Open wide the doors to Christ. Do not be afraid to open the doors to Christ. And this morning in our office of readings, we had his inaugural homily. He said, brothers and sisters, do not be afraid to welcome Christ and accept his power. Do not be afraid. Open, I say, wide the doors for Christ to his saving power. So often today, man does not know that which is in him, in the depths of his mind and heart. So often he is uncertain about the meaning of his life on this earth. He's assailed by doubt, a doubt which turns into despair. We ask you, therefore, we beg you with humility and with trust, let Christ speak to man. He alone has words of life, yes, of life eternal. So it's Jesus Christ who is the remarkable one. And in the saints, we see these remarkable lives throughout all of Christian history, lives transformed, lives that live lives really beyond the natural because of the divine life that is in them through Jesus Christ. I was looking over my notes this morning about the funeral of Pope St. John Paul II. Do you remember it? One of the things that I most vividly remember about that funeral was the wind. And so his coffin was there in the piazza of St. Peter's. The cardinals were all dressed in red, which was the color, which is the color of the apostles. I'm wearing an apostle's vestment here, white for Pope John Paul. And the wind was blowing. They had to hold their zucchettas, and some got blown off. And, <laughs> and the gospel book was on his coffin. It was just flipping back and forth throughout the whole gospel. Couldn't we think of the Holy Spirit and the power of the Holy Spirit that was so evident in the life of this remarkable man? And in that funeral, do you know that it was the largest funeral in history? the largest funeral in history. It was the most watch, watched event in television history with an audience of, of, of two billion estimated. The first US president to attend the funeral was there. The Queen of Spain, the King and Queen of Sweden, the King and Queen of Jordan, Lech Walesa, the President of Iran, the Chief Rabbi of Rome, the President of Afghanistan, the president of France. All of these people that had come because of the effect that he had have, had in so many lives. 
he met more people than any person in history. I was privileged to meet him, and I said to Father John Paul before the Mass, because Brother Bernard, he said, now you met Pope John Paul, so your hand would really be a third-class relic. <laughs> so I said, Pope John, I said to Father John Paul, you want to touch a third-class relic of Pope John Paul? And he said, well, I have a second-class relic in my pocket. <laughs> <laughs> so he didn't need that. <clears throat> but he met with so many people at his private mass that he would have, and I was privileged to be there twice, once as a seminarian and once as a priest. Cardinal Jivic, who was his faithful uh, secretary for 40 years, he said that he always felt it was important to have lay people there, that the whole church would be represented even at his private mass. And it's a fascinating book that Cardinal Jivic wrote and the title of that book is A Life with Carol, My 40-Year Friendship with a Man Who Became Pope. So he was always at his side. He's now the Cardinal Archbishop of, of a, on, in Warsaw, in Poland. But he wrote about, in a chapter titled, A Typical Day in the Life of a Pope. And he gives us a little bit of an insight of the spiritual life of Pope John Paul II. He says that Pope John Paul was, was in love with God and he lived on God. He was in love with God and he lived on God. Would that that be, could be said of all of us. And he talks about how when he first came to, to Rome, it took him a little bit of an adjustment to get used to being cooped up in the Vatican. And he was a man of the outdoors. He loved to ski. He liked to go into the mountains. And so they planned a trip for him to secretly take him out to the mountains to go skiing. Nobody knew about it. They just had one of the uh, other secretary's cars, and they secretly left there. And he so enjoyed that day. He had the opportunity to go skiing. And he said we had over 100 of these excursions where we would go out, and he would just go out in the mountains, we would chat during the meals, but then he said he wanted to go out to converse with the Lord. And he would spend hours just praying out in, in the mountains, praying with the Lord, being with the Lord. But he said after a few times that they had gone out, no one had recognized him because he was dressed in his ski garb until one day a 10-year-old boy said, there's the Pope. And then they realized well, we better take some other people along and, and make this uh, more known. But he continued to have those excursions where he enjoyed just being out there to pray, as Cardinal Jivic said, to recharge his batteries. But he talks about, you know, all of the things that he would do in his work. And of course, a pope is a man who is very busy with many appointments. And he loved meeting with people. He loved hearing their problems, praying for them. In his pray do, in his private chapel, he would pray there before mass. And in the drawer, they had intentions that people had sent to him to pray for, and he would pray for them. And some of them responded saying that they had received the favor that they were asking him to pray for. So he said that even in his work day, his work was peppered with prayers with short bursts of prayer. So it was as if he never stopped praying throughout the day. It wasn't a rare occurrence for one of the secretaries to look for him and find him prostrate on the floor of the chapel, completely immersed in prayer. Sometimes he would sing quietly during morning adoration as well. He was a man in love with God who lived on God. He loved the Blessed Sacrament, and our men's scholar today is gonna to be singing a Marian hymn. Of course, his coat of arms had a large M for Mary. His motto was totus tuus, from St. Louis-Marie de Montfort, because of his devotion, his love of Our Lady. He had lost his own mother at a very young age. And they'll be singing a Eucharistic hymn during communion, Panis Angelicus. He was a man who loved Our Lady, he loved the Blessed Sacrament. 
And his closing encyclical, I men mentioned this first encyclical on Christ, the Redeemer of Man, his last encyclical was on the Eucharist. And here's what he wrote of his own experience in adoration. And I encourage you, if you're looking for a refuge, if you're looking for some renewed strength, spend time as Pope John Paul II did before the Blessed Sacrament. And here's what he wrote. The worship of the Eucharist outside of the Mass is of inestimable value for the life of the church. It is pleasant to spend time with him, to lie close to his breast like the beloved disciple. I like to picture that. It's a good thing to picture Pope John Paul. Picture that as you spend time in adoration, just picture yourself as being that Apostle John, resting on the heart, near the heart of Jesus. It is pleasant to spend time with him to lie close to his breast like the beloved disciple and to feel the infinite love present in his heart. How can we not feel a renewed need to spend time in spiritual converse, in silent adoration, in heartfelt love before Christ present in the most holy sacrament? How often, dear brothers and sisters, have I experienced this and drawn from it strength, consolation, and support? The Blessed Sacrament. It's really fitting that today, where Pope John Paul II's body is, and Father John Paul was just in Rome for the canonization of Cardinal Newman, and, and um, giving some spiritual uh, retreats and so on for our crew there in Rome, that he visited St. Peter's and what you find where the body of Pope John Paul, St. John Paul II is, to the right is a Pietà, the famous statue of Michelangelo of Our, our Lady holding Christ. And on the other side is the Adoration Chapel of the Blessed Sacrament that he instituted to have adoration of the Blessed Sacrament there. <clears throat> and there are sisters who pray there. The faithful can go there to pray as well in the Adoration uh, Chapel. One of the questions that I always ask, and I'll conclude with this, <clears throat> is what was the miracle that led to his canonization? His beatification miracle was a French nun, Marie Simon Pierre, who at the age of 47 had Parkinson's disease. And three months after Pope John Paul had died, she was praying to him and she was completely healed. The canonization miracle actually happened on the day of his beatification. There was a woman in Costa Rica who had a brain aneurysm and they had tried to operate on it, but they said it was in a place that it was inoperable and probably she only had about a month to live. This was in April of 2011. Well, May 1st, 2011 was the day of the beatification of Pope John Paul II. And she's watching the beatification on television, probably WTM. She's watching the beatification. And she falls asleep after watching that beatification and she's woken up by the voice of Pope John Paul II, who said to her, get up, be not afraid. The first words of his pontificate, get up, be not afraid. So she gets up because she had been told to just be on bed rest for the rest of her life. Her husband was surprised to see her get up and she said, I was healed. And when they did medical examinations, the doctors were stunned to see there was no aneurysm there anymore. She went to Rome and they secretly took her to a hospital where they examined her again. No, she was completely and instantaneously healed through the intercession of Pope St. John Paul II. So we thank the Lord that he continues to help us through the intercession of the saints like Pope St. John Paul II such a remarkable man who accomplished so much 
And he taught us also how to suffer well. The last years of his life, as you know, he suffered with Parkinson. His speech was slurred, but he continued to teach. He continued to go on, even though it was painful and difficult for him. He continued to trust in the Lord to go forward with that confidence in Christ and his power. And my second conclusion here, this is the final one, <clears throat> is from the Magnificat book, booklet today. They have a beautiful meditation, words of Pope St. John Paul II. And they're basing this on today's gospel where Jesus said, light your lamps. Pope John Paul said, do not be content with anything less than the highest ideals. Do not let yourselves be dispirited by those who are disillusioned with life and have grown deaf to the deepest and most authentic desires of their heart. You are right to be disappointed with hollow entertainment and passing fads and with aiming at too little in life. If you have an ardent desire for the Lord, you will steer clear of the mediocrity and conformism so widespread in our society. Our personal encounter with Christ bays life in new light, sets us on the right path, and sends us out to be his witnesses. Brothers and sisters, do not be afraid to welcome Christ and accept his power. Do not be afraid. Open, I say, open wide the doors for Christ. Do not be afraid.